Well, welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series, Artists in Conversation. I'm Hamad Nasser, curator, writer, strategic advisor, and senior research fellow here at the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, which is um, the YCBA's sister institution in London. I'm delighted to welcome artist Andy Holden to the program today. And before we jump straight in, some housekeeping rules, I'm sure that are familiar to all of you, but let me just run through them. Um, please note that this program will be recorded. Uh, your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We will be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather all your questions for Andy, and we'll answer them at the end of the program. But please feel free to submit your questions at any time. And if you would like closed captioning, a live transcript is available by clicking the icon of your navigation bar. Now, Andy's is a feral curiosity in search of form and meaning. Um, he's an autodidact who went to goldsmiths. He has a band, The Grubby Mitts. He ran a gallery out of his home called Ex Baldassari. He exhibits across the world, but lives and works in suburban Bedford, a 45 minute train ride away from London. And that distance allows him to step out of a London art world stuck in fast forward. What this time and space allows him to do is to really play with works that are vehicles for thinking through life's big abstractions, time, fear, joy, illness, grief. Now, rather than drown you in adjectives, practice types and gallery names, because his bio is available on uh, the website, we're just gonna quickly share glimpses into uh, some of his work. You start with the MIMS manifesto. It stands for maximum irony, maximum sincerity. Now he started this with some friends when they were still in their teens, finished it as a 20 year old art student. And this then became a complete work of art 10 years later. Uh, with film, with sculpture, with music. And some of the things that really struck me about this idea to start with the manifesto was not just the precocity of it, but also a propensity for uh, self-analysis um, and a leaning towards revisiting the past. Next, the pyramid piece. Um, you walk into the Art Now galleries at Tate, you're confronted with this collectively knitted giant piece of rock. Now this is not life size, but really the size is a reflection of the guilt perhaps that Andy felt when he snagged a keepsake from the pyramids on a family holiday to Egypt. And a decade later, he, here you see him trying to return it back. And through this sort of uh, simple act of, of taking a flight back to return that piece of rock that's, uh, that was in his study, I think he's asking some really large questions around you know, what do we do? Can we undo what we've done? Uh, and, and does this apply to individuals as well as to museums? Next, we wanted to visit Bino, the art of breaking the rules, because exhibition making is very much part of Andy's practice. The exhibition, in some ways is the ideal vehicle uh, to collect uh, objects, people, ideas, and also make propositions into the world, uh, a world that he then invites people in to, uh, to share the space with them. And if Bino was all about breaking the rules, the last uh, project that we'll do as an introduction this is his most recent public sculpture called Auguries. Now, where Bino was sort of playing with form here, Andy's, you know, in a way, he's putting on his Sunday best to accompany the family to the church. You know, it's, uh, it's polite, it's recognizable, but he uses that politeness uh, to, to play with, with things which are perhaps a little dark. These are bird songs, uh, memorialized as totemic sculptures, uh, all to do with birds whose populations are fast disappearing in a place, Wakefield up in Yorkshire, which was the home of one of the world's first 
recognized nature reserves. Now, I actually managed to miss most of these works that I've been speaking to you about. Um, and my first encounter with, with Andy was a few years ago when we started sort of uh, working on the British Art Show. So the first work that I physically encountered is this one called The Structure of Feeling. And perhaps we'll start by just letting you in on that experience. Blessing in this gentle breeze. A visitant that, while it fans my cheek, does seem half conscious of the joy it brings. Andy, maybe we can start our conversation by just uh, reflecting on the the scenography of uh, of this installation. What drove it? How did you go about uh, coming up with this um, with this way of experiencing your work? Yeah, I, I mean, this work takes very deliberately the shape of a fun fair ride, a uh, ghost train of sorts. Um, it's in a way a sequel to a piece called Laws of Motion in a Cartoon Landscape, which we'll look at briefly, I know, but it, and Laws of Motion explores the early age of cartoon making um, and the absurd inverted logic of cartoons. And I was thinking, well, how do I follow this? And I was thinking, well, what came after the birth of Disney, the birth of cartoons? Oh, Disneyland, the kind of the move to the experiential. That was sort of the, so then I thought oh, that's that's the compositional strategy I need to adopt for this. But it was also it was uh, coming out of COVID. So there was this set of parameters around the piece where I was a the talk about how to limit numbers into the exhibition. And I'd been actually it, it worked in my favor to persuade the gallery that actually only accessing it on mobile electric carts would be the way to go. And so it, and that allowed a degree of control and immersion. So you get in the car, you drive for 45 minutes, you drive around, you park up and you plug into the films and you listen to the seven short uh, animated films that surround the installation. And every so often the whole thing is synced as if, a, so when the lights suddenly dim in the whole space, you put on 3D glasses and the big screen emerges and you can view that. The structure of feeling was the title and it, um, it comes from a phrase from Raymond Williams, which is this sort of texture of the world that art can maybe make visible that is just below kind of perception, um, something that's kind of maybe not graspable in one single work, but you see it in the repetitions and the echoes in form in certain kind of cultural artifacts that maybe can point you towards the way the world was going. So this was a sort of uh, yeah, a premonition in some way. It turns out to have been more of a premonition than I could ever have imagined. But it um, and the seven short films all take tiny moments of um, what I've been calling the cartoon landscape, which is sort of an analogy for a kind of uh, 
a, a, a new type of logic that's emerged at the tail end of capitalism. Um, so give an example of one of the films, uh, or this, yeah, there's, um, uh, it's all made out of backgrounds from Scooby-Doo cartoons and the text is taken from Freud's interpretation of dreams, but boiled down to seven minutes and loosely kind of, uh, and then it's intercut with me recording my own dreams as I wake up uh, in the night. And then I'm, I move through the Scooby-Doo houses, uh, analyzing them as if they were a dream, trying to understand this cartoon. So it plays with this sort of far end of, uh, well, how to make sense of the illogical, of the irrational. Um, one of the other chapters takes Wordsworth's prelude and boils that down to seven minutes and takes uh, Wiley Coyote's landscapes and imagines that they're the Lake District after an environmental disaster. Um, so they're, they're, very, they're quite kind of the far end of this idea of the laws of motion, which we'll, which we'll maybe we'll, we'll move on to to make sense of this one in retrospect. I'm, I'm struck by that idea of, uh, of laws of motion because we've already talked... Uh, about you know breaking the rules, um, you know politeness of following them, and then this like you know we started with the manifesto, uh, and now we're getting to laws of motion. So there seems to be this constant uh, or or, uh, or cyclical interest that you have of trying to understand what makes things tick. Um, yeah, I think that's right, and I think there's often a sense of trying to get above. I mean, we saw it, that's why we, when we showed the MIMS installation, we showed an image from the balcony and you look down upon this, these numerous fragmented attempts to uh, depict the formation of this art movement. In this one, you have, you, you circle around trying to assimilate these uh, the fragments, but then there's always, a, uh, I think that we'll, and we'll see it again when you get towards the end of the talk with the show that I opened last night, uh, this motif that returns of these eyeballs in space, like one of the most simple images that I could maybe manifest. But again, that is a sort of sense of getting above a kind of omnipotent view, looking down, trying to create a, trying to see those larger structures. Um, there's, there's, sort of, there's, there's two moves, I think, in the work. There's the almost psychoanalytical move of going to, inwards towards looking at these moments of subjectivity which is present in the mims and pyramid piece that we started with looking at formative moments of ones and, and we see you here on the, on pretty much on the couch yeah yeah you could see it that way um and then there's this uh, yeah and a lot of the work has at the heart of it these kind of dialectics this move towards uh yes to trying to examine these formative moments that then come to dictate the way you see the world later and then looking trying to get above the big structures that also makes our uh, dictating to a certain way are uh, the interpretive possibilities that we have of making sense of the world. And so, yes, the eyes in space becomes a kind of reoccurring motif here for a kind of aboveness, uh, and the, the sort of the desperate attempt to get out of the subjective viewpoint. Um, but the rules, yeah, this is a sort of, they are a way of making, yeah, the way of making sense, you know, I mean, this is, this is where we sort of already slip this. These are, I guess, the big questions, the things that, yes, how can we, you know, uh, formulate something that will remain true? And my, well, on that, we'll just move to the the laws of motion in a cartoon landscape, because this this was, just, in a way, a six-year investigation. A lot, a lot of my projects, I think it's, I should say, are probably... It's at least a four year cycle from kind of idea to completion. So they're quite, and they're often almost novelistic in length. And this one is no exception. Um, it's, but it starts with a very simple thing these a set of ways of interpreting the logics of a cartoon and the things that help us make sense of something that we're trying to say, why does this thing, why does this thing that shouldn't make sense make sense? Um, let's, should we show the first law just to give a clue? A good, yeah. Oh, this is, oh, maybe it's also just worth this, yeah, uh, this is me as a cartoon version of myself, and this sort of is also maybe a right sort of distancing approach to creating a kind of uh, persona that could stand for me, but out, but within the work. So it's a way of both being kind of being in the work and outside of the work at the same time, and this was this is what enabled me to make both these uh, structure of feeling and laws of motion, really, was this idea of how do I get inside the screen how can I, to understand something, I need to be within it. Uh, so I'll make a cartoon version of myself and insert myself into cartoons in an attempt to understand them from the inside as well as from the outside. Hmm. 
History's come to an end. The world has come to resemble the cartoon landscape. The golden age of cartoons proved a prophetic, short-lived glimpse of the world we now find ourselves within. An examination of the laws of cartoon motion might help us construct a theory of how an artist can proceed within a landscape in which everything is already done, where every action is seemingly possible, yet certain actions reoccur. For in the cartoon landscape, it seems like anything can happen, yet not anything can. There are rules that emerge as, over time, we begin to make observations. Law 1. Anybody suspended in space will remain in space until made aware of its situation. Yes, yeah, so that's just a short extract. It's actually it's an hour long double screen animation. So it takes you through all the all the the ten laws of the cartoon landscape through the examples, and then extrapolates out this, and uses an attempt to understand the current moment really, where there's sort of things could be in multiple places at once, where speed had increased to a point of absurdity, where yeah, where cut where people in charge appeared like cartoon villains. Um, it makes light reference to the current political climate, but uh, only light reference. But it off, but it doubles as a yeah deep investigation as well into this early period of animation, which it sees as a kind of premonition of the world to come. Well, I think it was also just struck uh, when seeing it again as to, in some way, how your Mims manifesto uh, and that call for a maximum irony and a and a maximum sincerity is is some it's you know it's most everyday recurrences in the in the in the cartoon landscape um, where we're able to see both those things in action. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it felt like it was a strange thing. Often you yes, you think you're doing something new, and then you yes, you. I mean, I think I've come to terms with the fact that manifesto and that formative moment of writing that at 18 years old, it, it has kind of continued through the work. And it, even if the same dialectic of irony and sincerity are not the two poles that are being moved between, they're being replaced by similar, a similar sort of pincer movement somewhere else um, between, and in laws of motion, it's probably, yes, the illogical and the logical, or and making clear that these things can't, be separated out you know that the idea of trying to that they're always and also this idea of simultaneity of things being yes holding two ideas in your idea in your head at the same time you may being both ironic and sincere simultaneously that to be one might not uh, allow you to access the space that you need to get to to even to get to the most sincere space you might need to occupy a yeah that that even that will be contingent on a on a certain amount of irony I, I think I mean you you introduced um, your cartoon character as a as a distancing device but um, but I think one of the things it also does um, it does very well is it in in sort of foregrounding the personal because in in even in those sort of little introductory works that we talked about uh, you know, Bino, that was your childhood obsession, as I understand it, you know, so yeah. um, this was literally the kid in the chocolate factory, uh, the pyramid piece, again, this is a personal family story, and, you know, and, and, and making public that your, you know, your act of penance, your undoing that the, the, the enormous size uh, of this. And the next piece that we've um, selected to, uh, to discuss today, is another piece of biography. This is literally work that you had just come across. 
um, um, and, and the work we're talking about is Hermione. Um, do you want to just sort of walk us through a little bit or to introduce the work? Um, I will, I will. Just but before that, I should just, on that, I just want to, I think, all of it, it's a funny thing the way I use myself in, in, in the work, because if the work is to work, I have to sort of also leave the building. Like you, I go in through the, you know, it, it, there can be a mistake, I think, that it's about me and it isn't, uh, you know, but it uses this to access sometimes the very big questions. Like you have to risk this embarrassment of, uh, yeah, I don't know, showing how they, well, to think through them deeply, you have to th think through them from the personal. And I, but, you know, for a work, when the work works, I hope that, like, I I do disappear, I think. Um, so it is, and Laws of Motion was the one work I actually set out to think, I don't want to be in this work. This is about, this is about the world, not me. And then it didn't work. It just wasn't quite working. And then this device of putting myself in as a cartoon character suddenly ena exactly enabled this, identification but an identification that would then allow me to uh, I don't know become it's, it's a foil in some ways but but why I want to bring that before we talk about the next piece is because this piece was really attempt to fully step out of the frame and try and put uh, allow uh, another avatar to take over um, but it's a delicate balance because she isn't it's not an avatar um, you know there's there was some confusion when this piece was picked up in the newspapers and the radio, people asking whether it was true or not, whether Hermione was one of another construction of, uh, had on Radio 4. They, you know, they, were, they were convinced and trying to pull out of me that maybe I'd faked this uh, story, but I, I haven't. Um, Hermione was a real person, and this is a work where I do, although my voice is all over it as a narrator, I, you know, it's not about me. Um, and that makes it a little, a little different, but you'll, yeah, I think the links with the other pieces will probably be apparent, but it, it is... Yeah, from the, in that sense, it was a, uh, quite a, a different texture for me. Uh, should we show a little clip before we talk about I it? I think that's a good idea. But Hermione Burton, I shall never forget, and uh, uh, an incredible woman, a very spiritual woman, and she had a daughter, and I think... Um, either the mother or the daughter, or possibly both, had uh, had major operations and they'd been close to death on several occasions. And the style of paintings, well, I suppose it was a primitive, sort of uh, naive style, but uh, very, very personal, very direct. And uh, yeah, I'll never forget her. It was a privilege to have known the uh, basic kindness, I think. It's just the paintings are haunting. We need to float without direction in the deep blue black darkness, saying defiantly over and over. This is what is real. This is me. This is my red hat. I first saw Hermione's paintings in this charity shop in Bedford. As I looked around the shop, I realised all the paintings, which I had on first glance thought to be by different artists, the usual eclectic jumble of landscapes and portraits propped up amongst the furniture and hung above the clothing rails, were all marked with the same bold signature. Each painting clearly proclaimed the artist as Hermione. I'm just going to uh, jump you forward to when Hermione appears on screen so you get an idea of the animation for this one. I'm raised in Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire, the seventh child of an eventual family of 12 children, and I attended St John's School. My father was a self made businessman who encouraged his children to live a full and interesting life. At 14 years of age, I was given the position of running his office. With virtually no training, I was expected to do all his bookkeeping. He gave us confidence, never doubting we could attain our goals. And this was to help me immensely in my many encounters in later life.
Thank you. And I think so. Um, we may just recognize that the the configuration that we see on the wall here, and this is on the Whitworth Gallery as part of the British Art Show um, uh, last year, is is actually the reproduction of a painting of Hermione. Um, and in a way, her, Hermione had herself uh, decided as to what her retrospective needed to look like, um, and and you were kind of honoring that as 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 a start uh, as a starting point. Yeah, it was. I mean, I say as as it, as it sort of says in the voiceover to reiterate a little. Yeah, I found these works in the charity shop, and I found also this little self-published autobiography she wrote, and I found a painting of her imagined retrospective and. As far as I could tell, she'd only ever had one show in her lifetime. All the painting, uh, all the paintings had just been, um, yeah, abandoned. And I just I stumbled upon them. But I had this feeling that amongst them was something very interesting that I hadn't seen before, which was that they all appeared almost like frames of a film, and that if I was to assemble them in some way, this I could bring back or uh, Hermione and make for her the show that she never had. But also to tell, on the one hand, to tell her story, but on the other hand, to there's something very mysterious in the paintings to me, which was that they spoke of a very particular what I what in the film I go on to call the time of the sick, a kind of uh, a sort of dislocated non-linear time. They are they combine memories with the present. The compositions are disjunctive. There's a sort of strange oscillation between these joyful colours and this quite melancholic shimmering below them. They have this, yeah. They they have a they have a strange resonant frequency that, that I recognised, uh, which was a sort of out of timeness. And um, the idea of putting together the show for her and then preparing it with a biographical film about her life, bringing her back as a animated version of herself, seemed like well, it was a sort of yeah, four, a four year journey to kind of piece it all together. But um, and using the paintings as a starting point to make to combine to make the animation for the film and and very soon after this i think actually earlier this year you um you reimagined its presentation um at the at the gallery of everything um it becomes sort of much more domestic in scale um do, do you want us just to sort of talk us very briefly as to some of what you were trying to do with this presentation yeah I, this <sighs> The Gallery of Everything is, uh, yeah, uh, it was a sort of, it's a wing of the Museum of Everything, which you might know, which is a huge collection of uh, what we, outsider art. But obviously this term is a lot of what this film is picking at, actually, you know, trying to understand this. Uh, I mean, we were talking about these dialectics that float around with the irony, sincerity, the, the rules and breaking the rules. The With this one, this question of what, yeah, how we position one in terms of history and what is considered outside uh, is kind of at the heart of this and positioning at the gallery of everything which what they do normally is buy estates of artists that maybe haven't ever had any representation that you'd consider outside um and then they contextualize them you know they give them a historical narrative they try and say why they might have been art historically important or whatever but what was at stake with this is not a kind of the question of art history it's the quite yeah the question of what stories are important, you know, what story, and Hermione's story is, the, the paintings that, the best ones are amazing, but they're not, they're not, it's not a discovery of a remarkable painting, it's a discovery of a remarkable story, and how often remarkable stories might disappear, or not be charted, and what Hermione did was make paintings that are ultimately like a cross between diary and therapy, but they really present a document of a life that would be hard it's hard to do in words you know for me it was about the limitation of what one how one can narrate one's life but what what and the power of painting to tell a story that could maybe contradict the, the spoken word and so to put them together as a sort of I should say these little these little sculptural interventions based on my anim, animation that bring her back this is one of her very bold self-portraits um from 1980 most of the paintings are undated actually that was the only it was interesting one giant nude self-portrait dated 1980 the rest no dates which also made it meant i had to sort of put together the sequence but as the in the building you get a flow through it and the darker paintings these later paintings as well i mean it's difficult because i'm paraphrasing a 40 minute film but the um what happens is her daughter passes away and her and her daughter will become almost interchangeable. They they start to dress the same. They started to wear the same red beret, go out together, paint similar paintings. Then her daughter, very young, passed away. And, and in these late paintings, you can't tell who's Hermione and who's the daughter. And they become gradually 
more uh, surreal, more uh, yeah, more abstract. But there's a, um, and then yes, you in the basement, you you get the film of her life, which takes you takes you through these paintings. But this and this question of and what who speaks, you know, who who is maybe this is a little similar with Bino in some way, you know, the, the privilege of the artist to be able to maybe frame something in a way a curator couldn't straightforwardly do. Like maybe if this had just been a, if, if you'd found these paintings, how much like, and you decided to show them, you would have probably have to show, you'd have shown them. I'm, I, I, this may be unfair. You may, but you know, let's just say, let's not say you, because that was getting awkward. Let's say uh, somebody less imaginative than yourself uh, did, um, you know, you would have a sort of, there would be a kind of objective analysis of what the paintings, where they might fit in historically, what they might tell us, given what the paintings show. But as an artist, I, I had this feeling that I was maybe could do more with them than uh, simply represent them, but to try and understand them, to get inside them, to give a voice to them. And that's what the, so the the film and the paintings are put in dialogue to do this. So you, you kind of walk, move through the paintings, then watch the film, but then you can return back through the paintings. And so you get, you get this sense of, um, I think what I'm trying to do is also some of, there's a tendency with self-taught art or art of, art of the margins, as I was sort of calling it, there was to see a, there's a kind of vernacular uh, that you would say, oh, that's, that must be uh, due to a technical limitation of skill. But what if we see them as deliberate? What if you say, no, these are actually saying something very precise. And what if we take them not quite at face value, but try and try and really under, understand what they might be, um, what she might really be trying to communicate. And that's what the, that's what the film I hope tries to do in there, but lets the paintings also breathe on their own and say, well, they may be what I say they are, or they may be what she says they are. And so somewhere between the two is the truth. And I think on that, I, I wanted to draw out two, two points, and then perhaps we should sort of move on to the next work. One is, I think, in just this arrangement, the, the arrangement of chairs, this is very clearly a kind of, you know, a basement cinema. Um, so the presentation itself is, is an invitation to come and sit. And, and like with many cinemas, you know, you may be sitting with people you do not know. The second thing, and I loved your, your articulation of it, is that it's not about, you know, what paintings are amazing or what works are amazing, but what stories are amazing. And thinking about what your intervention is in how those stories uh, find a public. And I think that's a really, um, that's a really powerful connection between the next work that we wanted to, to talk uh, about today, which is Catharsis. Um, and this is another work that is um, uh, we, uh, showed in, in the British Art Show. Um, on on the first sort of just coming across the object presentation, um, there is a certain cutesiness, you know, cat says, uh, after all, what makes the internet go round? Um, but perhaps, you know, it's it's about that sucker punch, that the disguise we talked about again, is to bring people in, sit down, and then you, and then the story starts. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, if we extrapolate, like if we are taking the eyeballs position just above the, you know, something that I do is on the one hand, there's the right back from, I mean, the pyramid piece probably had all this from the start in some way. On the one hand, there's this object that seems to be mute. On the other hand, there's this attempt to animate it in a very primary way, the attempt to sort of pull and watch what an anecdote or a story can do to transform an object. And then you realize how unstable the meaning of objects are. So although the story, so I think that's something that's maybe at the, in the strata just below what many of the works are trying to do. And I think Catharsis does it in maybe one of the most concise ways. Um, so actually, I, rather than explain that we've chosen a clip from the beginning of the film that goes with this. So there's a huge collection of 300 cats and then a video next to it. And or I'll show the start of the video because then that tells you. And a lot of my work does this. It tells you exactly what it is. Uh, it's something very early on that I decided, actually, the interpretation of the work <clears throat> should be inside the work itself. Like, there shouldn't need something necessarily outside it. Always try and tell everybody everything. And it doesn't make the work any less complicated because then it, it allows you to get a, get the easy stuff out the way in some way. So often I tell you, like Laws of Motion tells you at the start how it's going to unfold. Um, so does Mims in a way. So, and this one's no different. So we'll show the beginning of this piece. Hmm. 
Sorry. My grandma passed away recently. She was 90 and had been in a nursing home for the last couple of years of her life. We'd been close, enhanced in part by her living nearby, just at the end of the street. So she was normally around most days after school and she'd been genuinely supportive of me wanting to be an artist. When she died, she left me these boxes as my inheritance. Eight cardboard boxes containing her entire collection of China cats. So I thought what I'd do was unbox this collection. So let's unwrap the first one. My grandma collected these over many years. They filled her small living room floor to ceiling, displayed on wooden laminate shelves and every available surface. The thing that particularly struck me as a child whilst gazing at this collection of China cats was the fact that she never actually had a pet cat. Around the age of 10, I broached the subject with my mum. If grandma likes cats so much, why doesn't she just get a cat? But I realised now that I'd entirely missed the point. Just, um, just it's 16 minutes, this monologue. Uh, I just say it was devised actually initially as a performance. So I would do it on stage, sat with the couple boxes, take them out one by one and speak. And then actually it was a way of writing the work in a way to sort of relationship with, actually was, I did it in a couple of comedy clubs initially. And although it was true, I mean, this is maybe the most explicit version of irony and sincerity simultaneously. The first time I performed it was literally a week after my grandma did pass away. So, And it was genuinely, I was opening the boxes and I was ad-libbing the story. And then after a number of performances, I refined it to a monologue that I thought, uh, and I, I knew where it was going because I knew that I'd be okay if I talked for 20 minutes roughly about the cat. And it starts off with stories about my grandma, then it comes more and more about collecting and then and then stories about cats and symbolism of cats but then it ends up actually being about alzheimer's and control uh it, and how she coped with uh my grandfather's loss of memory and she is surrounding herself with objects that kind of created a perpetual present this was the idea but then it finished it finishes with a joke uh it's uh, the, the voiceover comes over the PA or in, in this case in the, uh, off screen on the video and says well how, how did that feel and I say it felt cathartic so the whole thing in a way is this all pinned on this one joke but it's a joke that's incredibly serious like because it, it sort of did and it was so it was both it's kind of it and it produces catharsis in the audience because there's a kind of relief that the whole thing had been scripted so there's a kind of so it was you know it was, but actually to yeah to to arrive at a very delicate description of the loss of memory and why we you know the the, the symbol the thing that seemed like trivial kitsch actually being a very uh, uh yeah, uh, powerful element, and uh, that yeah, to, as a coping mechanism in many ways. Uh, you know, to, to to arrive at this serious point, it, it used this mask of of comedy almost. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just there's a tiny there's a tiny little. I don't think my grandma was ever particularly fond of cats, although I do realise this quite a lot of evidence to the contrary. It was far more about collecting. Freud's evaluation of the impulse to collect is that it satisfies the need for psychological security. He thought it had its roots right back in our toilet training days, the anal retentive stage of childhood, and that collecting was a response to our distress, our inability to control our bodily expulsions and the trauma caused by the loss of shit that flows from us. Freud's hypothesis, therefore, the collector is trying to gain back control of their bowels as well as their possessions, which were long flushed down the toilet. And I think you have a couple of uh, slides of just the installation shots to, to share with people. So, um, this is in, in Wolverhampton. Um, and I think here we have it in Plymouth. So, you know, people can be literally be surrounded by by the cats. 
um, as they sit and then and listen to the story and actually kind of get lost in it. Um, and also, I want to pick up that, um, you know, we started by thinking about MIMS and self-analysis. Um, you used Freud in, in, in thinking through the act of collecting and, and that Freudian um, uh, segue, I think, is an interesting one also to connect to the next work, um, which is a work that you did with your dad um, called, called Natural Selection. Um, do you want to just, and, and this is you, uh, is it? Yeah. Or yeah, you it, get me to stage this? No, there was some confusion because I had a, I had a niece at the same time who was about the same age and it could have put it, no, it's me, age one, photographed by my father with this, yeah, upside down bird book. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's presented as a sort of collaborative work. Uh, in fact, in the whole show actually, was collab collaboratively authored between myself and my father and I should say my father's not an artist he's yeah he's an ornithologist he wrote he wrote books on birds and spent 40 years studying but uh studying birds and uh this was yeah a very long collaboration seven years really of working on this project um with yeah ending up with the two of us collaborating on quite a elaborate uh touring museum show that took the two of us and Rather than being a cartoon character of myself, I think I'm, I'm a version of myself, and my dad is a version of himself, and he very sweetly played along. I don't know how much he knew he was playing along, and how much it really was him sometimes. Like, but it's a, yeah, it, the whole the whole show is a dialogue between the two, and you could see it as a Freudian drama in some ways, although the whole show is masked about as being about birds. Uh, but anyone who watches it closely and watches the dynamic between the two screens go, oh, this is also about a question of how one finds one's self in relation to their father. So as well, like what I talked about my work earlier about, yes, it's incredibly personal, incredibly risky to bring your father on screen, to bring him with you to the museums when he is not, it's not his comfortable, it's not a zone that's comfortable to him. Um, but uh, it was, it, <sighs> There isn't anybody that doesn't have that dynamic somewhere, you know, that and that question of how one finds it doesn't you can take birds out the equation and you can take us out the equation and the dynamic will hopefully still be applicable. But but it does go very deep uh, into the world of birds, nests, particularly and eggs. Um, this, it started like interestingly the same the same as catharsis same as laws of motion it started as a performance and I don't do so many performances anymore. Um, but they were live works where the two of us would appear and we'd be either side of a screen and there'd be this conversation between the two of us. And I would, my father would talk very much in the language of natural history and Darwinian uh, notions of natural selection. And I would talk try, maybe more poetically questions, I, I, trying to tease out maybe other ways of thinking about the nest or the egg. And um but uh, yeah, and in that sense, you really get the sense of the two of us and these conversations that took part and the sense of me trying to find myself in relation to his kind of authority on the subject. So we show a show. Sample. Sorry. Maybe we can get a little. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So it went from live work to that. Now we'll show you yeah, a tiny little clip. This is an example of a domed nest. This is elegantly oval and perhaps the most perfect object found in the British countryside. It's the nest of the long-tailed tit. These are normally concealed in thick, prickly bushes, making them very hard to find. These nests are even more remarkable when you think that a long-tailed tit can make a nest like this in its first year, having never been shown how to do so. And it does seem hard to believe when you look at how this is made. The material used is a compact mixture of moss and gossamer, lined with feathers, and the outside embedded with hundreds of flakes of lichen. It's an almost magical object. Something I find odd is that birds' nests, as objects, don't have names. However, reading around older documents, we found that the nest of the long-tailed tit had been an exception. In the past, it had numerous old country names. In Norfolk, it had been known as the bush oven. In Northamptonshire, it was the oven's nest. In Suffolk, it was the putney poke. In Nottingham, it was a bum barrel. In Buckingham, it was a bottle tom. And elsewhere, it's been referred to as a feather poke, pudding bag, hedge jug, jack in a bottle, long pod, and poke bag. The long tailed tit's nest earned it the reputation as the master builder of the English countryside. And its delicate dome is perhaps only rivaled by one of the most marvelous of all nests, those made by the weaver birds of Africa and India. In Africa alone, there are 78 different species of weaver, and each of these lives up to its name. 
Um, yeah, so it, it takes this three screen form, the triple screen format, and uh, it really is a detailed explanation of how birds make birds nests and the sculptural. I mean, for me, it was, I should say that the, the what lays below this is my father was responsible. He ran uh, in England uh, organization called the Young Ornithologist Club, which is part of the RSPB. He was responsible for getting a lot of people interested in birds and had a TV show where he would, you know, in, uh, enthuse about birds and educate people about birds. And it worked on a lot of kids, uh, except me, you know, uh, because, uh, well, because he was my father, I guess. And I had to find my own way through. And I actually started wanting to be an artist very young. I had to build a studio by the time in the, uh, my mum's utility room above the washing machine when I was about 16 and started very deeply uh being invested in making art and thinking about modern art and um it was only it was much later that i looped back around and i started to see, uh, found some specimens of these birds nests and i started looking at them as sculptural artifacts and thinking these things are incredible and i said but then i noticed that not many people talked about the nest it was something i, I said to my dad why why not he said, well, it's sort of it's not really a subject anyone talks about in the 50s and the 30s there was some but it's just something they considered it's innate it's something they can just do there's not really a study of birds nests in in, in contempt so this took us on a very long journey because i was thinking that some of these things are like it's almost a history of sculpture here there's some of the most incredible forms so we started going into museum archives together looking at these um yeah beautiful specimens and i started to kind of collect them, investigate them, making replicas of them. Um, I won't show the next clip, but I will, because um, I'm conscious of time, but um, I will show, yeah, this is the sort of one of the sculptural outcomes. This is a scaled up version of a bower made by the bower birds of um, Papua New Guinea and Australia. And this becomes the central motif in the show because it's actually not technically a nest. It's built ultimately as a sculpture. You could argue it's part of sexual selection and, and for display, but even Darwin in his Descent of Man starts to talk about it in terms of judgment and beauty. And it's so for me, it's this linking point both between nature and culture, but also me and my father. It becomes this kind of moment of connection at the end of the film where we both marvel over this, the inexplainable mm, desire to of this, the uh, inherent creativity of nature in some way. And and you know, and that actually we find this kind of common space to speak about. Um, so it frames the film. So as you come in, you you see the sculpture, and then the film is through, it's displayed on three screens on the other side of it. Andy, I don't want to rush you, but we do have some questions coming in. Um, so so maybe we can move to um and this is uh, really very generous of Andy because he literally opened this exhibition last night. Um, so uh, you are getting something very fresh. Um, okay. And um, I had the, the privilege of actually walking through this a, um, a few days ago while it was still being installed. Um, and I was really struck by, um, and, and, and we'll sh share some images of, of, the, of the two rooms, um, of the of the gallery, um, and I was just struck by uh, your continued interest in ideas of time, um, thinking of time uh, in in many different ways, as as sort of cosmological time, geological time, biological time, uh, and also biographical time, because both both these rooms. Uh, are also, uh, you know, a, a, an intense part of, of your life. Um, and, uh, and perhaps with that, um, if you could give us a little window into, into these two rooms, and, and then we can open it up uh, to the folks who've been putting questions uh, uh, to you already. Yeah, I'll play you one 30 seconds of this. Just your tongue. Just your garments. My sister and my bride, just your shoes and my garden and my beloved and my garden. Oh, that was the first room. It's a set of prints called Infinite Resignation, and then a sound work called uh, 16 Channels Sound Piece called uh, uh, Just Song of Songs, which you might know. It was a composition by um, 
David Lang, but re-performed by my band uh, for brass section and done on a vocoder instead of the three-part harmony. And that just plays in spatialized sound around the prints. It's a very, it, this is a, it's a very tough show, this one. Um, it was actually sort of the first show back really after a bit of an absence. And um, it, uh, yeah, two rooms, that room, which is very dark. And then this second room, which is bright, but absolutely overflowing with uh, a piece called the library for the unfinished concept of thingly time, which is, yeah, it, 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 it was my first attempt to understand this kind of these other durations that uh, exist outside of subjectivity uh, that are somehow below that may that objects can contain that that and sometimes can reveal, but only in certain combinations. Um, sorry, that was the wrong button. Um, that's that's the end. That's it. I just chose two pictures. I realized. Yeah. So it's that one. And that one um but yes they uh it's a too long a story probably as to how the library came about so i will uh keep it to that but it's really the strata that sits below a lot of the other work it says and there's lots of fragments of pieces from studio and in the studio lots of maquettes and then these totems of plaster that spiral upwards these overflowing vases um and at the heart and then rows of uh what you can't quite see here is quite how many books there are it's, these are all they're both plinths and bookcases so they are full of uh two libraries one belonged to my late friend dan and one uh is mine um and both yeah both rooms are very much about uh lives cut short uh very in different ways um and the different time spaces that they open up um and the ways of dealing with those one is very very empty uh and one is an attempt to fill that emptiness i think but i won't say any more or, or i might slip so uh yeah happy to move on to questions thank you andy and 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 um thank you for sharing this with us and before we move into the the question and answer session and we do have a few um that I've been sort of looking at and accumulating and, uh, and organizing. I just wanted to also draw our attention. Um, you know, earlier we spoke about, you know, we pointed out those rows of chairs for Hermione and that and that cinema. Um, that you know, uh, your attempt to create that space and invite people in. Um, and it struck me, sort of coming back from uh, looking at this show earlier this week. That you you're continuing to do the same you know there was the cinema in Hermione the first room here that we walked through depending on you know where you're coming from it could take you to a chapel a church a shrine um, and then you end up in the library uh, so these are all places um, that you know you can occupy space uh, together with that I really want to open up to to the questions and and I'm going to uh, to combine a few, because I think there are two different strands that are coming through. Um, a couple are very specific around particular works, so we'll take those first. Uh, and then the, the others are, are actually sort of uh, more general around practice as an artist. When you're starting, when you're stuck, um, how do you move forward and your motivations? So I'm going to start with, um, with somebody who wanted to know uh, the material of your augury sculpture um, and they point out that they almost look like wood turnings how were they made well actually they were made as wood turnings initially as the studies that's right but they are uh, in that version they are bronze um, and it's the first time working on with bronze on that scale uh, but yes initially they were they were devised as wood turnings and then to, to fabricate them on this scale we uh, had to make them as 3d prints next to scale up the 3d print and then worked with very good craftsmen to enlarge them in, into bronze um they uh yes yeah, the first, there's you know certain conditions around public sculpture that um yes yeah, about durability and uh i mean also i'd say the material is very important there because these species are birds that have declined 50 percent during my lifetime uh which is which is huge and the idea of the title augurs is from the roman ancient Roman practice of using birds to divine the future. This idea that from the, from the, uh, these patterns of movement, you know, would dictate in something like, like um, uh, yeah, I mean, there, it, it was more, you know, only literary accounts of it, but the idea that they use birds to decide when you're going to war or what was vulnerable. But now, of course, data is kind of maybe the equivalent. So it's looking through the, what I call, the, what's known as the red list to see which birds are vulnerable and be able to use that to dictate where the future might go and for me they're very melancholic sculptures because 
bronze, the lifetime of bronze, I think will outlive the species that they depict, unless we change tact on how we uh, deal with agricultural farming and climate. So they so they do, they talk, you know, they put, they, they make a, a, um, a provocation really that the bronze, you know, the lifetime of bronze, if you were to, is probably a thousand, you know, it can be a thousand years, 2000 years. And these birds may, the songs of these birds may disappear. And then we'll be left with these strange, mysterious shapes, which represent the songs of those birds. And in the future, someone might think, well, this is what we have as a record of that. If, if we remove data out of the equation, I suppose. But that was the, the so the, the specificity of the material is, is always important. And that was the first, why moving to bronze for those pieces felt correct. And the second question is comes from Andrew Taylor, who um, points out that you put on an exhibition by the comedian Simon Munnery at Ex Baldessari a few years back. And he was saying, are there links to be made between Hermione and Simon, for example, a mixture of um, diary and therapy? And, this, and a sort of a second question connected to it, are you pleased if people find your work amusing? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, it was a really, uh, on, yeah, I, I've known Simon a long time and he was a real influence. I, I, um, and because, you know, he works right at the fringe of comedy. It's really about ideas, you know, and a constant production of ideas and a very inspiring person and and yeah the idea of mm, moving his work into a gallery and curating a show around that was it was easy to persuade him uh but uh he yeah a lot of trust involved um but i think you know with simon the comedy is one thing but it's how profound the work is often that is the other thing you know it, actually the thing we have in common is his work he, he, he it, it looks flippant but then arrives at some huge existential questions and the way he could open up that space to me was always very inspiring we have a as sort a of 10-year dialogue of talking about stuff together and um he doesn't really understand art and i don't know if i fully understand comedy but somewhere between the two we 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 you know we we, have, we just talk about books and ideas um sometimes yeah like the i use is to say like 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 <laughs> irony isn't always humor you know sometimes it's a Kierkegaardian irony it's a much more it's a cosmic irony it's not always the irony of humor but sometimes yes it's you know it's for me a way I have always strove for the work to be accessible uh but also without relinquishing any complexity I hope um and so if sometimes to use to take you on what sometimes is quite a long journey some of the you know the films are sometimes are long the exhibitions are dense that you need I do punctuate it with uh Amusement wouldn't be right, but, you know, often, you know, tragedy and comedy are very close and, uh, you know, they're two different ways of seeing the world. And uh, a lot of it depends on the lens you place upon it, I think, um, you know, uh, it's. Um, uh, and those two things, like, yeah, they're not they're not completely inseparable and they're just different, different ways of coping with the difficult things. Um so no, it's fine. Yeah, you know, it's like what Ham was saying, I thought, which about this work at the end about uh I should say, you know, it's, it's really this one is explicitly called the library for the unfinished concept of thingly time. It leaves space for someone to come in and try and complete the idea of what this prop I didn't explain it very well, and I'm sorry for that, but it was this idea of thingly time was an unfinished proposition that this work invites you to complete. Um but a lot of the works do that too. They they hopefully do leave room for you. That's what I meant earlier about me. Yes, it's, it's sort of when you start, you think it might all be about me, but then gradually I think we somehow swap, you know, and hopefully you start to occupy, you know, I'm just a, uh, I'm just an avatar for your, for others to enter the work sometimes or or literally enter the work. Um, somewhere amongst that was some sense, I hope. Even and, if there wasn't uh, that mind. I'm going to sort of stop you there because I want to now just try and string together the three outstanding questions that all uh, are to do with the practice as an artist. Um, and, uh, and and maybe sort of ask you to respond to them collectively. So I'll, I'll read them out to you. So one was um, around what motivated you to become an artist. Second is around how do you overcome creative blocks? So, I mean, you mentioned that you're coming after a, a long time uh, to do this exhibition. And the last one um, is what advice uh, do you have uh, if you're into that dangerous game of giving advice uh, for aspiring artists. Motivations, blocks, and advice. Okay. Um, I mean, you you framed it well at the start. You know, curiosity is 
is inherently motivating the desire to you know, the desire to make sense of um that is probably wiring in some ways uh i've noticed even you know even when i think and maybe that brings me on to blocks even when i felt i should stop or i have stopped um yeah, the need to understand is just displaced into something else. There's, uh, you know, it's, it, that is, in a way, natural selection touched on this. I think the question was why my dad has spent his life dedicated to trying to understand birds. And you think, why birds? You know, why, there are other things, but of course, it, but it's not like it's transferable to, I don't, to botany necessarily. But, it, you know, why something captures somebody's imagination is, is a fundamental mystery. And in natural selection, what you feel is that my dad's curiosity towards birds drives him, makes it, it, it dictated his movements through his life. And my curiosity for art has done the same. And then you start to see, oh, OK, but are these subjects interchangeable? Both yes and no. Like they're, they're both they, these people they're, they're there's something inherently. And that's why natural selection is so rich, as I mean, as a concept from Darwin, not the exhibition. Uh, I hope that is too it's up to me, <laughs> um, which is that, you know, of course, it's both the nature and nurture. You know, how much of what how much of what take we take in from the outside affects how we interact with the world, you know, that and 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 the theory of natural selection is a wonderful way of thinking that through um the, the amount of like uh yeah how much of it is innate and how much is uh received vertically from the parent and how much is received horizontally from the world around us and those those questions are just the fundamentals in ways lots of the work unfashionably returns to a kind of ontological metaphysics at times it's really you know it is it is why the big questions remain fascinating i don't you know will that they just they probably perpetually will um so those will and i think relates why hermione related to me was that yeah art at times has been necessary to me it has a therapeutic quality it has a, a way of making sense uh that i need uh, i need to externalize i found um if I try to keep it in, it's not good. Uh, I I somehow need to see it out there. And once I see it out there, I, I can make sense of it. Once it's inside, I, I can't. So, but that is maybe the just a wiring I'd share with anyone who puts the artist hat on at times, you know, just I the need to see it beyond yourself. Uh, and that's the bowerbird, you know, the bowerbird need takes joy and pleasure in making this incredible construction why don't know like why did it suit not to sing well or its plumage to be beautiful why did it decide to make something well you know even in darwin at that point relinquishes some of his ideas and has to this recourse to the word beauty he's just like well maybe it finds it beautiful you know so and these are these these questions are the fundamental ones to me and lots of the work they will never solve them but they 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 tread carefully around the edges of it and see how deep into the forest they can go um yeah, and advice tried is easy. Uh, try to keep two ideas alive and well in your mind at all times. If it will not kill you, it will make you stronger. I think on with that quote and that image of uh, going into the forest, it seems like a really wonderful time for us to draw this to a close. Um, Andy, I you know I uh, thank you for being so generous with your time uh, for sharing. Um, uh, so honestly and sincerely with us a day after your, your opening. And, and thank you everyone for joining us and staying with us, even though we've gone, uh, I think, five minutes beyond our allocated time. Right. And last but not least, thank you to Linda and Jane and the team at YCBA who put this uh, together and for, for hosting us. Um, and uh, we hope to see you uh as a continuation of this program uh follows on next thank you thank you so much